do it. Cool, Let's do it for real. Uh, episode 31, uh, something from everyone with Justin Leach. So I started this podcast as something from everyone. And my name, uh, the name of the show kind of came from this idea of like, you can learn something from everyone. Yeah. Uh, and I've had your name on my list for a while. I wanted to pick your brain of like, yeah, we were just chatting how like I've, I've seen you work for a while and I've enjoyed a lot of stuff you put together. But I never got a chance to pick your brain of like what it is exactly and how it all came together. I'm sure there's a lot more work that goes in behind the scenes than the glorious couple hours I see at the venue. It, it definitely is, man. I think like I just slide that even closer. I think to like your, promoting shows is so it's a thankless job that mm-hmm. I think like yeah. a lot of people kind of neglect. Yeah. You know? And and it's not like people do that. It's not like an intentional thing. It's just right. like people wonder how the show happens. And they think of like the stage hands. They think of like the artists. Like they think of the headliner. Yeah, yeah, they think of the headliner. Mm-hmm. They might think of like the tour bus driver. Yep. But like, how does it actually happen? Like, how does the deal happen? Yeah. You know, like who are the people booking the band? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's uh I appreciate you having me on. I've never actually had somebody pick my head over this before, oh, so yeah. it should uh, be a fun one. I'm excited to be the voice of it. Or yeah, hopefully, man. <laughs> hopefully I get to be. Um, yeah, I appreciate you making time. Let's dive right into it. So I want to start with the heirloom. So I know that's kind of, or my understanding is where you start. Uh, is there anything before the heirloom? Are you booking like local shows? Are you doing stuff in like at high school as you're getting going? Where does this thing start for you? So booking shows for me came from being in a band and getting really tired of it. Hell yeah, okay. Um, so I was in a few local bands when I was growing up. Like, I mean, this starts like probably freshman year of high school in New cool. Fairfield. Cool, of all okay. places. And I just had some terrible bands, like some of them materialized into something else, like became more serious. And funny enough, the place that I actually got my start at was at the room in Brookfield, Connecticut, which for people that don't know was like basically like glorified teen center. Yeah. Like almost yep. like and people like people from this area remember did you ever go to the Max in New Milford? That's a little after mine is the ATC. Is okay. My so of it. like but the yeah, Max same, same. was like a teen center in New Milford. Yep. And I still think it's there, but they used to do like used to be like crazy metalcore and deathcore shows That's at this sick. place. And the room was like that. So it was like run by this guy, Vern, who is somehow still kicking around around Poughkeepsie at like the chance. But, um, but he gave me my start. Like my band would play and play shows for him, sell tickets. And then one day I was like, Hey, like a lot of these shows are not really well attended. Like, could I like put together a lineup? So he mm-hmm. let me do it. And I like really liked it a lot. So, I guess like over the next few years, like I kind of tra- it kind of transcended from like me putting together a few shows to me like being like, oh well, I wonder if I could like I got eighty people here like last week. Like I wonder if I could like book like a bigger band. So I think like the first real band that I booked was this band Spies Like Us, and that was like they were like a metalcore synthcore band from like I think it was like New Hampshire. Okay, and they're all like at that time like I was like reaching out to these agents who like. In the grand scheme of it, I like built up to be like these massive people. Mm-hmm. It was like some guy living in a, you know, Fair living familiar, in Pennsylvania yeah. <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yep, yeah. But uh, but nonetheless, they gave me a chance. Yep. So I, I would overpay on these shows, like not knowing like what bands get paid. I was mm-hmm. like, well, yeah, thousand bucks. Sure, that seems They're all fair. millionaires, of course. But yeah. but like, you know, like that band is getting paid a hundred dollars from a real promoter. Yeah. So I had no like concept of like deal structure, the way mm-hmm. all that worked. It was just trial and error. If I got to interject for one second, I think that's the right side of history to be honest, that you were overpaying by accident. I think the flip side is you could have just been like, here's 30 bucks. Is, yeah. that, is that enough? And, and at that point, it would have been a non-starter. People would have been like, why am I going to even like mess around with like even or attempt to give this guy a chance? Yeah. And that's kind of been my thing with video is like, I, yeah, I think maybe I undersell myself sometimes, but I'd much rather that. I'd much rather have a bad deal now that benefits the other party and then build that relationship in the future. And I assume that's been a successful part of you is that some of these people who you overpaid came back and were like, yeah, we'll work with you again. You treated well, us well. You took care of us. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. Um, the way I got my job at the Webster mm-hmm. when I first got hired was I got a, I got a phone call from Scott Lee. And Scott's one of my best friends to this day, you know, like one of the best people you'll ever meet if you get to know him. Mm -hmm. And one thing I will say is he called me one day and was like, hey, are you the kid stealing all my shows from the Webster? And I was like, I was like, yeah, that's me. And he's like, he's like, you need to work for me. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) So like, you know, that's like moving like really forward in this whole thing. But um. But yeah, I mean, like, that's how kind of how I carved my teeth. Like, and I, and it wasn't like an intentional thing. It was just like you, you with, with talent buying and like booking bands, it's wisdom that there's no school for it, right? Like you could yeah. go, you could go to school for music business, but ultimately they're not going to like teach you what a band is worth. Mm-hmm. They're going to, they might go over like different deals, like finances, operations even, but like, yeah. this is something that you learn to do. And it's something that is all like based on relationships yep. and i think the other 
piece there is you're working against all the other idiots who have made a bad name for promoters. I assume that generally like, my thing with photographers is like male photographers have a bad rap. There's like a, a stigma of that of like, yeah, you're just trying to take photos. You're trying to get access to people. Like it's a very, I don't know, uh, predatory thing almost oftentimes it, it is i'd say and, like in just like anything like photographers i'd say for like every 10 photographers or every 10 talent buyers like mm -hmm. eight of them are like not good either not good good at what they do or they yeah. just don't have the best interest in mind of like not only the fan but the band yeah. itself so not only is there no one to learn from but the people who are willing to teach you are probably not worth learning from anyway like you oh, kind of have to do it yourself absolutely or in my case like yeah. they don't want to teach you because you're a threat to them yep. your competition yep and I think like that's the hardest part about talent buying. So, you know, when I was, when I started getting serious, like at the room and, you know, I was like, I booked like two or three national shows and I kind of got to a point where like, I want to, I wasn't able to learn from the guy that owned the place because he really didn't have like a grasp on how to do it himself. It was just like a lifelong dream of like owning a venue. And I think he was still figuring it out. So and, like, what cap is this venue? How big is it? <laughs> it might've been like a hundred, like, I think, Okay. 200 cap room, maybe. Perfect. Awesome. So, so you sold 250 tickets some nights, but 200 but, cap. But yeah. it, it was the weirdest place, too. Like, if you've never been there, it was, like, in a warehouse in the middle of Brookfield, Connecticut. And they had, like, the guy was very, like, ticket sales focused. So, like, there would okay. be times where it would be, like, if your band sells 50 tickets, you can go to the top of the room where the soundboard is, and we have video games up there that your band can play during sound check. <laughs> big. That's big. And yeah. it was, like, and you're just, like, so is this like a teen center or is this a venue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's crazy. So yeah. nonetheless, like I kind of like got to a point where like I outgrew it. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of bands didn't like playing there because they kind of, you know, it's like the pay to play motion, you sure. know, it's, it's yeah. that whole notion of like, all right, we're going to, you have to sell 25, 30 tickets for this nothing band that no one's ever heard of before. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, when I went to the heirloom and like got an offer to like, you know, do a show there. I was like, yeah, sounds like a great idea. And also too, like one of my friends at the time who I met um, from the airline, his name is Brian DiCrincenzo. Awesome guy. And at the time he was the one booking all the shows and he was like booking like hour last night, like transit. Um, and they were getting like all these really cool shows. So I was like, okay, cool. It's a great opportunity. Like I could, th this is somebody I could learn from. Are you out of high school at this point? Are you getting to college? I was, go to college? I was right out of high school at okay. this point. So you're 18 I started, and figuring out what life's going to hold for you. And yeah. some guy says, hey, how about this? It, which which was great because I had no clue what I wanted to do out, out of high school. Okay. Like I had no, I, I was, there's not one part of me that was like, yeah, I'm going to go to college. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't like I was against it. It was just, I have no clue what I want to do. And better off, like I don't have like a family that's going to pay for that. So like, yeah. I don't want to waste my own money. Yeah. Yeah. Or spend all the summer jobs. Like, yeah. what summer job are we going to spend? Gonna do? How many are in $60,000 in the summer? Like, that's just <laughs> yeah, not exactly. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. basically what it was. So yeah. I was I was living at home. I was working two day jobs at the mm -hmm. time. Like, one of them was, like, selling kitchens. And the other one was working at Microsoft, like, when they had, like, a retail store in the mall. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that it's sales, though, and I assume to some degree sales comes back. Yeah, and is a it's an underbelly of what you're doing. You're disguising sales and hospitality. Almost. It does. Everything comes full circle in yeah. some way. But I was basically like, I found myself booking more and more shows, mm -hmm. and you know, I was doing well enough with them where like more people, instead of me hitting people up, people were starting to hit me up, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then I started getting like more offers from like different people that I haven't worked with before, like more established agents mm -hmm. and I was like getting bands from like pure noise getting bands from like victory when they were a thing at the time Absolutely, yeah um sumerian even these are my glory years yeah <laughs> so it was like it was weird to start getting all these offers but mm -hmm. I was still a naive like little kid that mm -hmm. like didn't know how deal structures work mm -hmm. so well, all, like, I, all I knew was I want to do it yeah you yeah. know so I did anything I could to like to do it. And, and a lot of times that meant overpaying and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like again, not knowingly overpaying, just like, yeah. oh, I think it's worth that. Mm -hmm. So then my two jobs became like a way to fund, but the losses that I was taking in the massive like ATM withdrawals I would do at the end of the night. Yeah. <laughs> so. What were some of the big expenses? So you're putting on a show at this point, where are you yeah. losing the most money in this process? Is it just paying the bands? Is there, it's, it comes down to talent. Okay. Like the venue was super cheap and the way the heirloom was run was like it, it was run by like, it was almost like run like a co-op. Like there was a guy, Jay, that owned a place who's like a great dude. Mm -hmm. And 
but he was he always had like a day job i think at like the ridgefield playhouse okay. so he was always super busy um and then it kind of became like like it became a co-op where we're like we were all like oh we have to pay the rent next month like we got to get one more show in the book that like that like you know we just need another 400 bucks and we can pay mm-hmm. him otherwise like our landlord's gonna kick us out yeah and i mean there's times like admittedly and i can say this now because like <laughs> Because, like, the place is closed. But, like, there was times where we didn't have, like, liability insurance. Mm -hmm. And, like, I had shows. I think one, I had, like, Vel Maya. And I, like, was so afraid that, like, somebody was going to get hurt and I was going to get sued as, like, an 18-year-old kid Mm -hmm. that I, like, had people sign waviers coming in saying, like, I will not sue the Earl March Theater or Justin Leach by attending this. I'm I'm laughing. Uh, it's a great memory. It's also great of, like, the waiver never would have held up if something had oh, gone no. wrong. Like, oh, any would've... lawyer would have had a field day picking that thing oh, apart. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I, like, it was... Yeah. I was just a kid. I've done the same thing. I've, I, I've definitely had to sign video contracts or send people, yeah, whatever versions of that. And you're just like, and wait, it's like, mm-hmm. this isn't going to hold up with anybody. But at the time, yeah. like, you're naturally like, kid, you're like, well, like... Even if it doesn't, like at least like they, they knew what they were doing, and like maybe maybe this like helps my hand a little bit. At least your conjures can be clean in that scenario. A hundred percent. Your your wallet is still gonna be <laughs> wham, but yeah, at least you could be morally sound and like yep. I don't know. And there is also a uh, yeah, you did try and tell people, and yeah, you did your best, but it wasn't yep. always good enough. Uh, so it's talent that was mostly like you're talking about the losing money in this process. It's mostly talent. It's mostly yeah. bands coming in, uh, and then not recouping on ticket sales. Is that still? That's basically where... what it came down to, and like you know a lot of people don't realize there's so many different revenue streams as a yeah. promoter. And there's even more if you own a venue, mm-hmm. like, you know, one of the a revenue stream people, I think some people understand now with like Ticketmaster being so egregious with like their fees is like ticketing fees. Mm-hmm. What a lot of people know is like the venue gets 90% of that ticketing fee. Yeah. Like, you know, the ticketing company itself might take like, if, if the ticketing fee on like a $30 ticket is like 50, or it's like $20 mm-hmm. or like 15 bucks, let's say. The venue is probably getting like twelve dollars and not fifteen dollars. Interesting. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, ticketing companies are still making hand over fist, right? Yes, like yeah. they're still making a ton of money, but like that's just like if it's if it's like a thirty dollar ticket, it's really like okay, this is a forty three dollar ticket, mm-hmm. but that thirteen dollars extra, it isn't going to the artist. Gotcha. So. When is that thirty dollars mostly going to the artist or exclusively? The 30, to the well, thirty dollars does for the most part, but like you know, you obviously have expenses and all that. Yeah. So, um, so on paper it, it does, and it gets a little bit more complex. Like there's a thing called back end. So it's mm-hmm. basically like essentially what that is, is like okay, let's say the show grosses like thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Okay, like the expenses, like I'm paying the band ten thousand, the venue is ten thousand dollars. So that's like okay, so that's like twenty grand right there. Mm-hmm. Then the promoter on a standard deal would get 15% of those expenses. So basic math is like, okay, so 15% would be on 20,000, be 3,000. Mm-hmm. So $23,000 is what the show actually costs after I get paid. Yeah. The artist can, typically on a normal deal gets 85% of that $7,000 on top of their guarantee. So basically okay. ensures that if a show does really well, the artist is going to get paid like what they should get paid. Yeah. You know, which is a fair deal structure. Like that's a pretty normal deal. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, like when I was booking shows, like that was the number one loss of money. It was just overpaying a talent, not mm-hmm. knowing what stuff was worth. And when I was 19 years old, booking bands like Val Maya, Val Jarda, you know, as blood runs back, black, let live. Like I didn't know what back end was. So I wasn't yeah. getting paid properly to begin with mm-hmm. on top of overpaying. Yeah. <laughs> Gotcha. Uh, how are you handling like, concessions at this time? Are you just buying water bottles and selling them yourself? Yeah, yeah. The concessions was uh, a trip to Costco. <laughs> okay. We had like a little snack bar under you, if you remember. Uh, it had, yeah, like, yeah. The, had like the cool like beer bottle caps mm-hmm. like is the counter, but uh, yeah, it was the venue owner, Jay, like before a shift at Ridgefield Playhouse going to Costco and be like, we need some more Coca-Cola. We're gonna, I'm going to go grab some. I'll be right back. Or we need more toilet paper. For, yep. <laughs> Damn. Okay. So you're getting the door at Heirloom. What like stands out as like your first milestone there? Like what you mentioned some of the big labels come, some of the big shows come. Like what stands out as the first time you're like, oh, I'm actually, I'm booking shows for the first time. Yeah. I think the biggest one was, I think the biggest show or the first show that like stood out to me was, mm-hmm. um, was Crown the Empire, Volumes, Ice Nine Kills, Secrets and the family re, uh, family ruin, which was, was like a band, which was like now. a band. Jesus. I think that that band no longer exists, but it was like a favor because I guess the, one of the guys in asking Alexandria like, managed them. Awesome. Nonetheless, okay. yeah. um, I remember that show because like I there was an agent. His name is JJ, 
And to this day, I'll still credit him for giving me an, like my real chance in music. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think he was like in between playing Danbury or playing Poughkeepsie. It was one or the other. Mm-hmm. And of course, I overpaid. And like he like hit me up, sent me holds, which is basically like, hey, like hold these dates tentatively for this show. Yep. So you know, I get I get holds from the venue, send them over, and I sent him a, a crazy offer that no normal experienced promoter would ever send. Sure. So he confirms the show with me. Is it like two hundred percent, three hundred percent? Like, do you have any sense? I was probably of like one hundred and fifty percent of okay. like what somebody else would. Okay. Have. So it wasn't crazy. It was sure. enough where I could. I still like that show, even though it sold out. I still made a few hundred bucks off of it, um, which like felt like the biggest victory. That's awesome. Ever. <laughs> That's awesome. And of course, in hindsight, that show. I mean, it's like Bitcoin growth. Yeah, yeah. Like that, whatever uh, that bill would cost now. 100%. That. I mean, that's, that's almost an arena show at this point. <laughs> yeah. Or if, yeah, pretty close. Um, damn. So you get that knock and the show goes well. I assume you have insurance by that point. Well, like, yeah, yeah. I had, I, had, I had like personal liability insurance <laughs> yeah. at that point and I became wiser. And I was also talking to more promoters, like, you know, because like I, you know, you start doing it enough and then you start talking yeah. to like other people. And at the time, um, Jeff Menig was like doing tons of shows in Poughkeepsie, mm-hmm. which his company was killer cool at the time. And I was like, I kind of looked up to him because I saw he basically made a market like Poughkeepsie, which wasn't an, a great market. It still isn't today, but he made it awesome. Shows are packing out. And I'm That's like, cool. it like inspired me because I was like, you know, if this guy can like take like a sh- crappy market from like anybody's standards and make it a great market that feels like home to people. Yeah then why can't I do the same thing here? That's cool. Was you that know? like your kind of competitor market? Was it all of a It was, Kipsy? yeah. And we like, okay. we always came, you know, we always came like close on shows, mm-hmm. like one of us getting them. Um, and then he like kind of dwindled down. I think he moved to Atlanta. So, you know, and stopped promoting. And he, so he's mostly focused on band management. So kind of worked out for me because I started like, you know, I kind of became the guy in that area. There's a power vacuum is the yeah. worst version of the term maybe. And and then my competition at that point became Webster. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so that sets us up great for our next chapter. Uh, before we move on. So what is like the, the process of booking talent? So my understanding is that you mentioned the holds and that there, someone reaches out to you and says, Hey, we have a package of these three bands. They're looking to come through the area. May 1st through 10th. Yeah. Do you have a day through then? Is that a rough approximation? Of the yeah. Process? So yeah, basically that's it. They'll, you know, an agent will reach out to me and say like, Hey, Justin, uh, we have, uh, we have X, Y, and Z band, uh, coming through, uh, your area these dates. Uh, mm-hmm. can you grab us holds at the venue and send an offer over? And in their email, they'll be like, okay, like they'll send parameters. They'll be like, you know, send your offer based upon like a $25 ticket. Um, $300. We need $300 for catering for the package, you know, mm-hmm. food and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, from there, it'd be up for up to me to do my research and be like, okay, well, you know, last time this band played, you know, a, a competitor's venue, like I think it did like 200 people. So maybe I'll base what I send my offer on based upon like what that did last time. That's a really interesting gamble then. Of so course. it's like, yeah, you know, I always tell people like the best way I could describe it, it's educated gambling. Yeah. Uh, and how much... Do you have any sense of like are shows worth more in the Northeast? Like if the tour comes through the U.S., the full U.S. tour, the same X Y Z bands, when they come to Connecticut, are they expecting more or less money than L.A.? Is L.A. worth more because it's a dense market? Like- Generally speaking, bands are expecting less money here. Okay. Now there are exceptions to that. I mean, like there's some bands that like have oddly done well in Connecticut. Sure. Like as you know, it's like funny enough. Like there's this rock band called Nonpoint. Uh, and I'm a big fan. Or was yeah. big fan. They're one of the first things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and great guys, like yep. awesome. But for whatever reason, like they do generally like two to four inch people in most places. I haven't had them a few years. Maybe it's more, mm-hmm. maybe it's less, but they'd come to Hartford and they would do like six or 700 people. That's wild. And it was just weird. Like they would like Hartford was a great market for them. Um, That's interesting. I always have this conversation in terms of like the Australia bands. So like they play some shows here and then go back to Australia and it's arenas. And yeah. I thought that even in our country, there's segments dude, it's, that dude, are Dude, it's that like fine. architects. Like here mm-hmm. they do like, you know, 1500, like palladium size venues, sure. Webster yeah. size venues. If you're playing like a smaller market mm-hmm. and they go over there and they're playing 10,000 people or they're opening for yeah. Metallica. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is, it's just like, it's like comparing apples to oranges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, is, so then Connecticut is usually expecting, you said less money because they're here. So then I assume the West coast is the more expensive coast cause it's denser. Well, yes and no. I'd say like tour stop in like usually four dates. Mm-hmm. You know, you sometimes you plays like San Diego Maybe you play Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Maybe you play like Los Angeles even. You know, you play Chain. So, I mean, you know, 
California is a gigantic state. So, I mean, and it's definitely super populated out there. Mm -hmm. So, like, they're able to do that. So, I think it, like, I don't know. It really, I don't think there's, like, an easy answer to that per se. But I'd say, like, I I think more so it comes down to, like, how strong a market is. Like, there's some bands. Like, it's weird. Like, pop punk traditionally doesn't do super well in Texas. Interesting. But it destroys up here. Interesting. Um, And vice versa. There's some bands that, like... Like country, right? Like I've tried booking a few country shows here and there, and usually they're a flop. You like Nashville stuff has never clicked up in the Northeast unless mm. it's like large scale, like Jason Aldean playing like Xfinity yeah. Center. But then like the same artist that like I'm gonna show that's at like 30 sold, and it's awful, like hemorrhaging money. Interesting. That same artist plays down in Texas, which is like kind of home market for him, mm-hmm. but he's doing like 2,000 tickets. Yeah. That's wild. So, uh, the uh, yeah, it's weird. It's like, you know, certain things are stronger in different parts of the country. It really depends on the act. It really depends on, like, there's so many different variables. You sure. Know? And I assume to, the other variable there is that if you're in the middle of the country, you're also saying, hey, you have to drive 10 hours to get here. We got to factor that into this. But this you know, you know well. what's funny? Sometimes it works to your advantage because, you know, like, sometimes the there's fans or, yeah. It, it's like, it's like, that was the thing about Danbury. That was super weird. I mean, there were shows that, like, Jeff Menig would do shows at like Tuxedo Junction and like even before like Hapreed used to play like Tuxedo mm-hmm. Junction at some point. Um, so they, they did get rock shows, but there was it was never a place like it was either New Haven or Hartford that shows would come to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, my theory was when I did shows there, like good shows, people would come out of the woodwork because they were just like, wow, I'm not used to seeing a show there. That's or people were whereas like, driving to new haven on a wednesday night for somebody that lives in like carmel new york would mm-hmm. be like too much of a commitment to be like oh danbury oh i have to go to that that's interesting so it's weird like so if you take the comparison like when a big rock show plays like south dakota people are all on top of that and usually they do super well because like people just aren't used to seeing a band like that in a place that's and that's the crux of the come to brazil joke right yeah. it's that only once a year to the 100 percent. i mean yeah. i remember like when i first had when i first had a tour come to the Earl Mart theater that had a full-size tour bus and everybody in main street just like looks around and are like whoa what's going on here that's you cool. know like literally everybody walks outside it, it got to a point where like there's this really good pizzeria, which if they're still open, I hope people will go there. But it's called Nico's. Okay. Awesome place. And I'd go there all be- before almost every show. But they would always walk and be like, man, you saved our business tonight. That's awesome. People, people just aren't used to seeing concerts down here. That's so, a really cool pat on the back that I hadn't even considered is that, yeah, in these markets, and I assume the Webster when we get there is a similar thing. It's like you, yeah, you brought people to an area where there wouldn't have been people yeah. and that allows these businesses to I mean, I would they, always have like the know. gas station clerk at the, the guy that owned the gas station across the Webster be like, mm-hmm. oh, you guys, you guys are rocking this month. Like we're doing great over here. And this is when they were selling like the sketchiest fried chicken yeah. that like was probably four days old and refried. It's probably still the same. Probably yeah. still the same. I hope they're still not selling it. Yeah. <laughs> but same if, bathroom. But yeah. if they are, God bless. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. It's a really cool pat on the back that the pizza guy come up with. Yeah. Almost thank you for it. And I hadn't thought about yeah. that. Like, yeah, there's a lot of kids like me that you gave a home to, but there's yeah. Business in the area, and especially in a Danbury where there wasn't a concert venue that yeah. Now 200 kids are coming. hundred uh, percent. Is it mostly metal and like hardcore shows this time? Have you, tried pop shows as other stuff so i was kind of booking i mean i've got my career in rock and metal Mm -hmm. and i've just become that guy so like moving into the webster and palladium was a natural progression for me yeah um but early on i was trying everything like i i was booking like i booked like this i forget her name but um she was like a american idol like finalist cool and she was from rhode island so i was like oh you know my friend derek at the time was like Oh, you should take this. Like, do you want a date of it? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll give it a try. Mm-hmm. Completely 180, like pop artist, you mm-hmm. know, solo acoustic openers. So I'd get stuff like on occasion. And I think as a promoter, you know, if you get serious about it, you kind of learn that you kind of have to, if you get offered something, sometimes you just, you need to try it. Mm-hmm. Right. And over time, you know, as you build up the business and a reputation, like you can start making a career off of just booking. If you want to book rock and metal, you can book rock and metal. Mm-hmm. But I always stride for versatility and I always want, I didn't want to be like a one trick pony. So I'd take shows like that. And then naturally like I would just get more rock and metal pop punk, obviously mm-hmm. um, indie on occasion. But I think a lot, one thing to consider is Connecticut's small, but certain bands do better in certain markets. Mm-hmm. Like, 
like, you know, like indie bands, like certain, like, especially like niche indie bands would never do well in Hartford. So I didn't even attempt to book him, you know, I would, I would rather have like the space have them, you know, Interesting, or yeah. the state house, because like, if I booked it, like we just didn't have that crowd. The Webster mm -hmm. is a historical, like rock and metal venue. Yeah. So I think that's Interesting. also part of it. It's not that like you couldn't make it work. It's just like, this works here. So I'm not going to try to disrupt that. Gotcha. And better off, like, not everybody's like this. Most most promoters aren't, but mm -hmm. I try to be respectful. Like, if somebody's booked a band before, I'm like, and they have history, and they've booked that band a few times, like, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. That's your band. Yeah. You know, like, promoters are very territorial. Yeah. Um, yep. Even though, like, sometimes, like, we'll get offered, you know, and agents will try to, like, get the, the larger offer, even if somebody has history. Like, I still try to be respectful of that. Yeah. Uh, the, before we move on, the other piece there is in booking shows. What are you considering when you get the offer? You mentioned that you're kind of looking into past ticket sales and you, what makes a band qualified? What makes you pass on the offer? What are some of the initial things or, uh, yeah, where do you even find those numbers? Where are you looking for that stuff? Well, I mean, it, like I'll ask around Yeah. if I can, to but, other a lot bookers, of, other but a lot of times or, I'll look, I'll look at past ad mats. Like I used to stock like old tours that the band has done or previous tours mm -hmm. the band says it on. And I'm like, all right, like where are the little sellout little check marks oh, on the ad mat? Yep. And then what I do is I do research and be like, oh, it's sold out uh, this 300 cap venue. Duh, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah. I'd be like, oh, well, they must be worth 300 tickets then. And I would kind of like find an average. Like there, I had like <laughs> some weird, wacky math equation to it at one cool, point. Okay. Um, so that was part of it. I think a large part of it is like, you got to be a music lover if you're going to do it. Okay. Like it is a fun job. You have to know it. But you have to about. have your ear to a wall. Like I remember I sent this was like a, like a year and a half ago. I sent my, you know, I sent John Peters, who owns Mass Concerts, sent me an email. I was like, dude, you gotta check this band out. And I and I sent them sleep token. I said, This band is like the most unique band I've heard in like God knows how long, like a fresh breath of air. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Oh, yeah, this is kind of cool. And he's been doing it for like I mean, he's like 55, like getting close, you know, upper 50s. Sure. But he still has his like ear to a wall. And he was like, oh, this is really cool. And I said this, band, and I said to him, this band is going to be one of the biggest rock acts in the next year. That band, we got him at the Palladium. Show sold out. We did like 700 tickets in a pre-sale. And that was within the first five minutes. So before the on, like at the on sale, we were basically sold out. We had like 100 tickets to release. That's crazy. But... That's also important. Like you, you gotta like you gotta have your ear to a wall. You gotta like know what people are listening to, what people are talking mm -hmm. about. Because it's really easy to get disconnected. Like yep. you know, if you if you're like in your own bubble and you listen to one thing, you're gonna get lost in the mix. And if mm -hmm. you do that, that's when you know you become that promoter that works with the same bands but doesn't really know how to That'd book or, <laughs> or or even market or like you know work with your marketing people and like how to make the show even happen. Yeah. Interesting. So you're, I, I like the idea of the going with past tour flights, really smart way. And then you're kind of figuring out the, yeah, if they sold this many tickets with this band, this many with this band, we can kind of, uh, in that process, you mentioned the, you had like a wacky equation you alluded to. Would you say you're like a numbers guy? It's, it's gambling. Or, uh, it's Definitely a numbers guy. Okay. English is not my, is not my first and favorite academic field. Okay. As we, yeah, it's got this like <laughs> I love, educated I, gambling. I'm, it's like, I'm a or, numbers guy, like sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Sure. But, um, but yeah, I would always take a look at it and be like, well, okay, well, you know, this show sold out in uh, in Chicago at 300 tickets. And then, and then this show sold out in Poughkeepsie at like at the loft at 250 tickets. So like mm -hmm. that's 200, 300 tickets, 250 tickets, like that's 275 tickets averaging. So sure. like I got to come in, you know, aggressive because I want to have this show over the Webster. Mm -hmm. So I should probably offer closer to like 280 tickets. Sure. So at least I have like a chance of breaking even and making money. Mm -hmm. Still a little bit of a gamble because like maybe this band's never played Connecticut before, but yeah. it's again, it's educated gambling. It's not a perfect science or a perfect math equation, but that's how I used to do it. Damn. Uh, so then you go through this process, you kind of, yeah, sharpen your chops at the heirloom and finally gain some confidence, some comfort in the art. Uh, uh, and you sent that, uh, yeah, Scott Lee gives you a phone call and basically says, you're coming to work with me. Yeah. Uh, do you know what year that was, Ish? Like, where are we in time? Ooh, 2013. Okay. Yeah, many moons ago at this point. Okay. Yeah, probably 10 years ago. And are you immediately out the door at the heirloom? Was that? Is there an overlap there? Well, the heirloom was interesting towards the tail end because the original owner, Jay, he ended up leaving um, 
and it was either the venue closed down or somebody else takes it over. I was too young. I want to do that. I mm-hmm. want to take it over, but I was too young. I knew I'd be in over my head. Yeah. Um, the other thing that made the heirloom kind of complex was that it did have a bar at one point and got shut down erroneously by the city of Danbury. Somebody got mad at a show and said they were serving people underage. It never actually happened, but they basically, in short, they shut down a bar. So I knew, like, I didn't know enough at that time to know that, like, if you're going to own a venue, if you don't have a bar, you have no chance. Yeah. You know, like, I could have a show on a Tuesday night and the show loses on the ticket money, right? Like, mm-hmm. maybe we lose $300 on ticket money, but then we have the service fees, right? Maybe we made $1,000 on the service fees. Maybe the bar does another 1200 bucks. Mm-hmm. So then it's profitable. Gotcha. And the bar is the, the big difference here. That's where big. the bulk of the show that, that is, is like, yeah. that is either a make it or break it. I'm, yeah. I'd say any promoter would agree with me. 70% of the shows that you I, see. Uh, I know in comedy shows, they have a two drink minimum. So that's even if you're not buying alcohol, they're still going to charge you two yep. drinks. Are there straight edge bands then a, almost a challenge to book because their audience is going to be straight edge and not go to the bar? Totally. Doing like the, totally. Yeah, the party bands of the world. I mean, are, I mean uh, there's some in? shows that like I'll overpay on because I'm like, oh, the bar is going to slam. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I've, I've offered like 90% of whatever the show's gross potential is. So like if a show can gross a maximum of $45,000, I've sent mm-hmm. 40 grand in. Yeah. Because I'm like, the bar is going to do 30 grand tonight. Yep. Like yeah. that's where the money is. And then service fees and all that. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize like uh, ticket sales don't make venues money. Mm-hmm. It's, it's liquor, it's service fees, it's everything else yeah. in the equation. If you own your own parking lot, forget it. You know, like that's another big revenue stream. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, cool. So then you get to go to the Webster. Uh, and at this point we're production managing, uh, talent buying and marketing director, three titles I have written down here. Uh, Production manager, I assume, is, yeah, day of show logistics. So that is, uh, yeah, what is day of life for production manager? So, yeah, production manager basically is, like, in charge of making sure that there's a schedule for the entire day. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, we're going to load in at this time. Um, You know, you'll advance with the tour manager. Basically, advancing means, like, communicate with the tour manager to coordinate these details. So be like, okay, we want to load in at this time. If it's a main room show, to be like, you know, the tour manager will have, like, parameters to be like, With our production, we're carrying like a semi with us. So we need like six loaders to help us unload this stuff, get it into the venue, get it back into the truck after the show wraps up. So I'd be in charge of like staffing all of that, making sure all our staff is advanced, meaning they have like they know what time loading is, um, making sure that like, you know, especially in like main room shows, we'd have like crew breaks or we'd have to do like crew buyouts because we'd have to feed people that are there all day, like production Mm -hmm. staff. Um, So it would be a lot of that. And then production managers also settles the show. So at the end of the night, I'd be like, okay, like I'd sit down with the tour manager and be like, okay, like the show did 1200 paid, you know, this is the show gross. This mm-hmm. is what you guys are getting paid after doing all the math. Yeah. And then they would be like, okay, well like we disagree with this expense or like, can you show us like advertising receipts for like everything? Because you know, during show settlement, like you got to furnish all that. Yeah. It's not like this is what we spent and have no backup. Like they want to see every receipt because if the show did really well, yeah, they're going to get that back end like we talked about earlier. Yeah. So and everyone's trying to run their own business. Exactly. They're trying to, they're trying to run their own dollars. business. Yeah. Everybody wants to yeah. come out making the most amount of money. Yeah. Which of course is always at odds where it's like, oh, your friends that I do want to help you, but we yeah, got to draw a line here. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Interesting. How does that process grow then? So you get to the Webster. Are you handling all the shows every day at the Webster? Is there another person handling some of No. This? So I stepped in. So when I originally came to Webster, I was just booking a few locals and okay. helping Scott out. And then he ended up wanting to leave town buying because he was just burnt out from it. Yeah. And at that time, he was getting a lot of momentum, like booking bands. Or not booking bands, managing bands, mm-hmm. rather. So he had like, you know, within the ruins, he had like Kublai Khan obviously like Acacia strain and a bunch of others that I'm, I can't remember right now. Sure. But he was, he was doing that. He had like shook clothing, which if you remember that clothing brand, um, he just had a lot going on. So he was, you know, one day after booking locals for a few months, he's like, Hey, um, I want to sit down with you. You would, you come up to the palladium and meet me? And I was like, sure. And he's like, get up there. And they're like, I want you to take over for me. I'm moving out to Portland, Portland, Oregon. Um, I don't want to do this anymore. You're the guy for it. So he introduced me to John Peters and awesome. Chris Besaw, who, uh, who was the operations manager for Mass Concerts for a really long time. 
And uh, yeah, it was kind of history from there. You and know? Is, is that a call? Uh, I assume it's exciting. It's rewarding. Are you ready for it? Is that a terrifying was, moment? Where are I you in that? I was so excited because I was okay. like, I can leave my crappy day jobs, which yeah. I hate. Yeah. And at that time, I was working two day jobs and I was like, I would go and then I would work the heirloom after that, also running the door on my own shows. So, so to be sometimes venues, we're like, two jobs. I just worked all day. I sounds like it. <laughs> all day and night. That's my other question here is, yeah, as you mentioned, the production manager stuff, it's like, so you're getting there when the staff loads in and you're then loading out at night. Like you're the, the person who's there longest. I mean, that is an incredible yep. day to be doing all day, plus a day job, plus another venue. Like that's just a, a gnarly schedule. What's like keeping you energized, motivated? Like what, uh, is it just the fun of doing it? Like why is it was fun of doing it, man. <laughs> I, you know, I always tell people and it's like corny to say, but mm-hmm. my favorite thing about booking shows is, I mean, I, inherently, I'm a people pleaser. Yeah. Like, I like to see people happy. Mm-hmm. So hospitality, like that kind of world, like entertainment mm-hmm. was like a big thing for me. Because I remember as a kid, like, there'd be times where, you know, I didn't love my home life. And going to shows as like a 16-year-old kid during yeah. the week was like my outlet. Sure. So I knew how impactful and meaningful that is for people. So it energized me. Like, when I started getting big shows and I see like 500 people lined up down the street, thousand people as it grew sometimes you know my largest show being like four thousand people i was like wow i got four thousand people here like these there's a percentage of these people that are unhappy with their life right now Mm -hmm. but for one night they're gonna forget about that yeah so that energized me enough to like kind of keep going and i just i was young at the time so i wasn't really i mean there's times where i was tired and burnt out but it was never to the point where like i couldn't keep going and i wasn't energized the next day i woke up I, I empathize with, yeah, I wanted to make people happy. And I think to some of you guys, what videos, what photos is for me is that 100%. I can save the moment for, and it, yeah, it's my own happiness. I'm creating my own happiness. Yeah. I like doing it, but yeah, there is something to be able to document that, right? A, a band come to me and it's like, oh, this was just a really like actualizing day for us growing up as musicians and getting to yeah. be here with the lights and the camera. And it's like, that's cool. Who cares how this video goes? Like, it's cool that we had this, yeah. had this thing. Uh, my challenge is I can never like stop and smell the roses. And I'm assuming that when you're working the show, when you're running around and it, you know, right before the headliner goes on, I'm not quite sure what fires you're putting out somewhere, but I'm sure there's something you're solving. Someone got kicked out or some security you got to deal with. Of course. Something that needs restocking, whatever all the different headaches are. Are you able to still appreciate the people there and being happy? Like our shows just like a, a torturous couple hours of problem solving? Or are you able to sit there and be you like, know, oh, this is cool? Some people dislike shows or yeah. running shows. I loved it because I felt more connected than ever. Of course. And, yeah. you know, I also, we like the Webster was a family. Yeah. Like, Corey, you know, Emond from Boundaries, like one of my best friends, still mm-hmm. one of my best friends, one of the best people. Dakota Remillard, like, Dakota, those were, they've worked for me for the longest time now as stagehands and even mm. at the heirloom, like they were playing in Limitless. They've been there forever, yeah. And they just, they're just some, some of the best people. Yeah. So when I went there and when I went to the Webster, I brought all those people with me. Yeah. So it was like, at times it felt like a clubhouse. That's cool. So like we were working, but we were just having fun, man. Mm. Like, you know, we were getting everything done, but like, we were still family. Like, yeah, there would be like crappy EDM shows that lasted until three o'clock in the morning. And then yeah. we'd load out at 6 a.m. and have to be there at 11 o'clock the next day. There, there were just times where we hated our lives, of like course. temporarily. Yeah. yeah. But for the most part, man, it was, it was awesome. It was a big family. And like that part of it, I definitely miss. Mm-hmm. But also, you know, like it's, if you're up late at night, And you're also like me, who has like kind of a double role in a company, like talent buying. I'd still have to get up the next day. I'd still in between like production managing during the day, I would have to answer emails, take phone calls. So always busy. But the one thing is like, the one thing we'll say is the thing that kept on energizing me was the fact that I was continuing to progress my career and I was getting offered bigger and bigger bands. Yeah. And being able to do that, be like, wow. Like, I remember the first time I booked After the Burial, and I was like, that was my favorite band for the longest time. It's still one of my top favorites. But I remember that, I remember like booking them and being like, wow, I have a picture with me and Justin Lowe from Warp Tour from like 10 years ago. And I'm like this little 15 year old kid smoking like a cigarette, which I, you know, I quit smoking a long time ago, but sure. I was like, I was just smoking a cigarette, like, you know, arm around him. I felt like the coolest person in the world, and I was a little fanboy. Mm-hmm. So it's weird going from that dynamic, like, you know, looking back and be like, seeing old photos like that, cringing a little bit. And you're just of like, course. wow, how the hell did I get here? Uh, I, <laughs> you know, one thought that like, I 
wrote I'll come back to. Uh, but I wanted to go back to the sentimental thing for one second. Yeah. As you're watching the show, uh, my other thing for me with videos is often hard because like I don't get to see people watch the video, right? Like I send it off and you watch it via Dropbox. Uh, and I had an experience recently where I was working at an event in an arena. And so I make like a hype video for the thing. And it plays in the, the Jumbotron before the event. And I get to watch the arena watch the thing. And it was a really like, not once in a lifetime, but like a really rare experience for me to watch someone watch the thing and watch all these people enjoy it. Uh, and I'm realizing you subscribe shows like you also get that of like you get to see all these people and there must be something uh, for me it was also cool of like uh, they don't know that it was me they were just enjoying a thing they have yeah. no idea that it was me yeah. and I'm thinking of you in the back of the room of the website it's like I know who you were but not most of the room does like the band people do the other people in the industry or the world do but most people there are just enjoying a show and you get to watch them and get the most like genuine feedback of what you're doing and the value yeah. of it yeah I think like that's it for me it's like I never did this for validation yeah like I mean, I guess like, no, let me, I probably said that incorrectly. Like I did, like I, val sure. I, I validated my own existence by doing something that made me feel good. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because seeing others happy mm -hmm. made me feel really good, you know, um, giving people like a platform to mm -hmm. escape for a day or a night that made me feel really good, mm -hmm. but I never did it to be cool. And, and, you know, I don't. I don't feel the need to publicize, oh my God, I do this or like act like a rock star yeah. because like, A, that's not who I am as a person, but two, like this is a job, right? It's a cool job. Mm -hmm. It's a fun job. Um, not many people get to do it or work, get to make a living. Like you get to make a living off of, you know, making video. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Being a content yep. creator is like one of the coolest things because you're yep. doing what you love. Mm -hmm. You're not answering to somebody, you're your own boss. Like it's one of the most fulfilling things you can do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, you, it is if, still you, a job. if you, it's a job. Yep. But it's you have to do what you like to do for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it for other people, it's not sustainable. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, and I think as an artist, especially, it's like, yeah, I have to make the thing that I want to make because I make the thing I think other people want to see. Yeah. Then who cares? And I assume in booking a show, there's a similar process of finding a voice of like, who are the bands I like to book, or how do I put a show together? What does a roster? What does a week look like in this venue? And there's a, a process of figuring out like, yeah, who am I? Who do I want to book? Who yeah. is this venue going to be? What is the identity here? Um, at the Webster, then, so we're we're getting going. Metal shows are coming in. Uh, I think my, my memory's right. For a while, you were close down the main room or booking less up in the main room with the idea of having bands sell out the, local, the underground more often. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were really interested. And I think I made this through the grapevine. I don't know if I heard this from your mouth. Um, but I think the goal was that you were hoping to just build hype and build an exclusivity to the venue and make people want to come uh, so that when the main... Uh, main room reopened there was kind of a rush a hype to it is that accurate is that a mentality that you yes have? yeah no that's uh that's pretty much in line so like we never closed down a main room mm -hmm. for any a period of time but there was a time where like you know shows were being booked like not my shows but mm -hmm. they were being booked and like i'm like why is this in this room like if it does 300 people like that looks that's like depressing in a 1200 yeah. cap room you know yeah. so the way I've always looked at booking shows and this way still to this day, look at, you know, look at that is the smaller room is always going to be better. Mm -hmm. The energy is going to always be better. Um, also like being able to see, you saw, you know, every time I die, play the underground and yeah. absolutely destroy it. Yep. It's the coolest shit in the world. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm sorry. Can I, can I, please, Chris? please cuss. Okay. Yeah, say everything you want. <laughs> okay, cool. uh, no, it makes me laugh because I, I remember the time as a photographer was like frustrated. Like, I don't want to shoot the underground. I want to shoot the big room. But then I remember having like the change of heart of like, Oh no, this is a, I get it. And this is a really smart business plan. This is a really smart plan. Not just for business, not just for dollars, but just for people just to make experiences better and to give more people a better night. Uh, and yeah, it really struck me as like a, Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I guess like a turn in the corner of like, oh, this is a business, this is an industry, this is a thing, not just the tonight, and this is about building, yeah, a year of shows, a, a history of good shows. Yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. Were there other like ambitious business strategies you had in terms of like where you put shows or what else is going on when you get an well, offer and you're I figuring think out like it goes? Before me, the, you know, the model with the Webster and the Palladium was like, we'll put a show in a main room, even if it shouldn't necessarily play the main room, if it's on a cusp of like playing the underground mm -hmm. because it's like, an artist that's like a little too small to play the main room, but they put in main room and like, Oh, we'll just have a local stage. Mm -hmm. You remember the, the Webster oh, yes. local stage, you oh, know? Yeah. Yep. And it's not like it's completely dead, yeah. but like I personally hated them because you know, you'd yeah. be talking opening doors at four o'clock on a, th on a Thursday or a Friday mm -hmm. to play like, you know, with a band like machine head. Yeah. And you would have to convince like my jobs. I was also booking the locals too. Mm -hmm. 
was like, I had to find, I had to convince four bands to play the underground, not even play the same stage at four o'clock because Machine Head doesn't sell enough tickets to <laughs> yep. make the show financially viable. <laughs> yep. And yeah. I, I love Machine Head, by the way. Um, so I'm just going to put that on the record. Sure. But um, we'd have to, you know, like certain shows, certain artists are just going to require like the extra boost. But I got sick of that because I was like, you know, like it, it is exposure for the band, but I'm not a pay to play promoter. Yeah. I've never been one. And, you know, the Webster would always get a lot of shit over like, oh, you guys are pay to play. I've never forced a band to pay for tickets ever. I've told bands before, like I've had frank conversations when I'm settling with them in the office and being like, hey, like you guys said you'd sell 50 tickets, like you were sure of it. You came up with three. I'm not gonna make you pay for it, but you guys are gonna have to play first because it's not fair for me to put another band ahead of you that sold way more. Yeah. And to be honest, probably not gonna have you back for a little bit or, you know, or I have to deprioritize you guys because, you know, I was, you know, we're counting on this revenue stream. Like we didn't just mm -hmm. put you on. Like if I could have, no, yeah. if I could have no locals on a show, it's easier. Yeah. Is that necessarily the right thing to do for the scene and the community? No, because I think I fundamentally believe that young bands need opportunities. Yeah. But giving bands the opportunity of playing on a local stage to 20 people while there's 30 or, you know, 300 other people in the other room, mm -hmm. that's helping nobody. Yeah, of course. Cause, yeah, because the, the 300 people are, who are trying to show the 20 people, the 20 people are going to be there no matter what. They're the friends uh, and family. A hundred percent. How does working with local bands and working with like touring bands different? Like you're booking the show. Uh, my experience would be or my guess would be that the touring package is way simpler and way more predictable it, it than is. local. It's just where all the nightmares are. And it's such like a, a stressor of like there's not even much reward here. I don't even this isn't the real piece happening. And it's taking up 70 percent of my brain power when it's, <laughs> yeah, 30 percent of the thing. That's it's, that's exactly it. Like, yeah. You hit the hammer on the nail there. Yeah, it's it's hard. Like local booking is an art form. And throughout the years, I got so busy, you know, between like everything in my life where I just like, mm -hmm. I didn't have time for it. I, I yeah. So I started like handing local booking off to people and I'm not a micromanager. Like that's not who I am, mm -hmm. but I would always like people always fall short of my expectations. Mm hmm. Like, I can't find a band for this. And I'm like, yeah, because you're not looking in the right places, you know? Well, I asked this band, yeah. I said, you've asked that band to play, you asked the band to play the wrong show. They're not a, they're, they're not a metal band, mm -hmm. you know? They're, they're uh, a classic rock band, you know? It's like, I, I think the biggest thing is like, there are so many local bands out there that you don't even know of. Mm -hmm. Like, I could probably, you could, if I listed yeah. 30 local bands right now, you'd probably be like, I've never heard of them before. Yep. Every week, I feel like I'm seeing a flyer, and it's like I, yeah, one of my friends is playing with this group of seven bands, and it's like, I, yeah, how it's am like, I? It's been like here I don't even know life. three of them, right? Yep. Yeah. So I was, you know, I said, you know, like if I couldn't find a band that would make sense for a show, and I, you, of course, as a promoter, you're gonna have tough shows. Not yeah. even if it's like a developmental artist, like touring artist, that like, all right, I could, I had to convince two bands to play this as a favor, with the caveat that I will get them back with a big show, and yeah. I had bands like that, yeah. and like we had that relationship where like I've taken care of them before. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, guys, like I'm telling you, I don't have real expectations for this show, quite uh, quite honestly. But if you guys do this, I will make it up to you. Yeah. And I think like there's that level of customization that you need to have, in, or custom personalization yep. that you need to have with bands when you're working with them. Because you just need to be real sometimes. You yeah. can't treat it transactionally because like you're building a relationship. Um, and you know, if you want to continue that, like there's certain bands I'll be like, hey. You guys want to play the show? Oh, by the way, do you know another band that would make sense? I'd be like, oh my god, my buddy's band would be great. And they mentioned said band's name. I'm like, I've never heard of them before. Mm -hmm. but check them out. I'm like, music's great. Yeah. Oh, they've played that show. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. And you know, so sometimes you figure it out. Sometimes it's you know, you 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 kind of find bands that way. And then other times you don't know what to do. And you're yeah. like, what the fuck? And you're just like, okay, well, let's go back to the drawing board. And then I go through like all the other local venues in the area like Springfield, like whether that's like Holy Oak and Waterfront was open mm -hmm. or like the Palladium. I'll go through event pages and be like, oh, what other local bands are playing shows? And I'll mm -hmm. be like, oh, I've never heard of that band, but they played there. So maybe, maybe you should find their Facebook page and find a contact for them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I assume that it's also then the lessons of local bands. I assume this is where a band like Boundaries or Currents has been so successful is like not just good on stage, but good off stage. So when you came mm -hmm. to, I don't know if those specific bands or bands like them and uh, and yeah, you went to all these boundaries as the example, just for the sake of a name, but you go to boundaries and say, Hey, this show's not selling. Can you help us out? They say, mm -hmm. yeah, no problem. We're going to be there. We're going to put on the same show at both shows. And there becomes this kind of symbiotic thing that allows them to grow in a scene like Connecticut. hundred percent, man. I mean, anybody, 
anybody that you talk to mm-hmm. will tell you, and I stand by this. Like anybody you talk to will tell you, like if you take if if you take care of me, like myself, mm-hmm. I will take care of you. Mm-hmm. That's the way I work. Like it's again, I've never forced men to sell tickets, but the bands that have done well for me have been motivated. They've been hungry and they didn't just buy their tickets. Like I've had bands buy their tickets and sure. quite honestly, I don't want those bands on the show Yeah, because they're not adding real people. Yeah. And it's views from China, right? right. Like it's the same as big social 100%. media views. Yeah. And I, I want people are going to bring like actual people in there because that ultimately is what helps the community. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, take a band like Currents. Like, all those guys in the band are my best friends. Like, Brian yeah. has been my best friend for over probably 15 years at this point. And, uh, and it's great to see the band blowing up and, and doing it's great. But it, it didn't just yeah. happen overnight. And, like, you know, I'm not taking, I'm, I will never take credit for their success because they have worked incredibly hard. Sure. They have a great team behind them. Um, but they hustled for me for years. I mean, that band has probably yeah. sold. 4,000 tickets, maybe 5,000 <laughs> tickets in their time as a band for me. Yep. And then it, come to, it came to a point where it was like, you know, guys, I don't need to sell tickets because I know you're going to bring people here. Yep. Like, actually, I'm going to throw you 100 bucks. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like a thing that had to twist my arm. I was like, one day I was like, you know what? You guys are worth the money. Yep. It's the same thing. Like, I, I say the same thing about Dreamwake. Mm-hmm. Love every guy in that band. Yep. But those guys have, whether it's Dreamwake or whatever other bands they've played Mm-hmm. you know shows of mine for those guys have always done well by me yep and it's gotten to a point now where like one day they were like shocked i was like oh guys you want to play day secret to play him and they were, and they were like yeah oh my god it'd be amazing this is when day secret was really blowing up like mm-hmm. last year in a sleep talk to her yeah and i threw him on a show and then i told her production manager i was like yeah you know what go give him 100 bucks it was a lot of money mm-hmm. and i was like and i think like and i texted guys i was like oh meg's gonna pay and she they're like wait what and i'm like yeah, you, you guys are a real band. That's cool. And somebody has to make that differentiation mm-hmm. between like local band and national band. Mm-hmm. Because like at some point, like there there needs to be that leap. And I think that it's important for bands that do hustle to know their worth. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important for the people around them, aka the promoters, the people that they're doing the work for, yeah. also remember that. So I always try to be cognizant of that. I'm like, you guys are bringing your gear here on a Tuesday night. You're playing a free show or what you thought was a free show. Mm-hmm. Like you're gaining that exposure. Yes, you are selling merch, but like ultimately I want everybody to win, including the artists. Like mm-hmm. first and foremost, the artist. I appreciate that. That's a, yeah, a good sentiment. And I, I think we would all benefit if more promoters working that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the one who's the expert on promoters, but I would assume <laughs> that the common band narrative is not that. that that's yeah, not what no, they've definitely. seen when they're in, in Philadelphia dealing with someone. I don't know, wherever, yeah. wherever they end up. 100%. Um, cool. So at the Webster, uh, where does the Palladium come into play here? And I know we're, at this point we're managing, we're talent buying, so you've got a lot of hats on. Uh, are you taking on help? Where, yeah, where does this thing grow? It seems so, like you've kind of already maxed out what you can do. So I was, um, <laughs> when I started buying like national shows at the Webster, I was also booking national shows at the Palladium. So, okay. you know, sometimes like a band is like, oh, we want to play Massachusetts. Like we're playing major markets. And like Worcester isn't a major market, but in the rock and metal community, like yeah. it is. Yep. Like you play Worcester, you don't play Boston if you're a rock or metal band. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just how it's been traditionally for many years now. Like Meshuga wants to play the Palladium. They don't want to play like Boston. That's funny. Um, unless it's like a, a, a tour deal mm-hmm. where Live Nation says, we're going to buy this whole thing, but it has to play our rooms. Gotcha. That happens on occasion, but um, was there any like conflict of interest there where you get a thing or you get an offer and it can go Palladium or it can go Webster? A hundred percent. I mean, I think like it's tough because both venues are kind of close in proximity, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, like you could make you could be at the Webster and be in Worcester in fifty minutes, yep. maybe yeah, an yeah. hour traffic. Sure, it's not a lot of time. Plus, you're sharing a lot of crowds. Like you're Springfield people, which is a pretty big city, mm-hmm. Holyoke. Western Mass, like yeah. they could go either way. They could go to Hartford or they could go to Worcester. It's kind of equidistant. Mm-hmm. So it became hard. And I think the formula before even my time there was let's buy two dates of this. We'll buy a Webster and we'll buy a Palladium. And then we'll like add local local stages to both shows to make them work. And mm-hmm. you know, there are certain tours that can do that. Like I remember having Wage War when they were popping off. Yeah. And I did two shows and he sold out both small rooms. Of course. Um and that worked. Yeah. Because they were just, they, they had, they were able to sell enough tickets to sell out both rooms. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, that's not the case. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's tough with the Webster because like, you know, the Palladium's always 
it always has been a more desirable venue. Mm -hmm. It's a better location. Yeah. It's a stronger market. Um, so I think, you know, considerations like that came and I found myself booking less and less of a date in Worcester, date in Hartford and booking, trying to like frame it around, like I'm going to do it in Worcester this time around. And then this next leg, I'm going to try to get it in Hartford mm -hmm. because it's like, you know, you're, you're putting your eggs in two basket and you're spreading yourself way too thin. Yeah. So like yeah. I'd find like where a show may have done like 800 people, you know, in Worcester, maybe it does 500 and Hartford does 300. I would assume that Worcester also has the benefit of having like the New Hampshire's, like the Northern States and Connecticut. Yeah. You have, is, yeah, you have Vermont, you have New Hampshire. And Connecticut stuck because we have Worcester and there's New York City and both mm -hmm. of them are really accessible. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like if you live in Stanford, yeah. like, why are you going to drive to Hartford? You're going to yeah. take the train into New York, you know, which takes you maybe 35, 40 minutes. No not driving. Even. It's better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. it's like you live in Westchester County, like you can do the same thing, man. How are you trying to uh, overcome that when you're at the Webster? How are you trying? Obviously, you're aware of this. It's not a surprise to yeah. you. How are you trying to overcome that and say, hey, come here instead? Is it this strategy of, yeah, put them at the Palladium next time and the Webster this time? Oh, so I, you I, make grinded, move, I grinded but, every show out. Yeah. Even shows that weren't doing well, I would mm -hmm. grind it out. I'd add another local band, which sometimes it, it, in me now, wiser me, wouldn't do that because I'm like adding bands almost de not devalues the show, but it degrades the show. Yep. Because nobody wants to sit through. Like, I mean, you remember it, all the local lineups at the Webster where it'd be like 10 bands? It's impossible. Yeah. yeah. Or like, you know, they, like Rusty, the guy before me that was just booking the locals at the mm -hmm. Webster and production manager. <laughs> you know, like, he would have like a birthday bash where he did like 12 bands. Yep. Starting at three o'clock on Friday. Yeah. And, and I, I loved those because they were great networking opportunities for me, right? Like I got three shows worth of bands to meet <laughs> in one night. But also it's like, yeah, man, no one can sit and watch it's like, 10 it's bands. It's like by like seven o'clock, you're like, ah, oh, kill me now. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. It's just no one wins. And the fans don't win. The bands don't win because they get these weird audiences that are coming in an hour, just totally disinterested. And there's, yep. there's no excitement, right? Yeah. I think part of being on a four band bill is like there's four bands. You're, either, you're opening and then we're one step closer to the headliner. By 10 bands, it's like, who cares where who we cares? are in this lineup? The whole yeah. day doesn't matter. This whole thing's a wash. There's no headliner. There's no opener. It's just 10 things happening Absolutely. today. Absolutely. And plus, yep. like, people like you and me grew older. Yep. And we're just like, oh, man, we can't sit for three hours. <laughs> we can't sit more than three hours. We can't here. stand for three hours. <laughs> I can sit for as long as I want. I know. Yeah. I like, I, I, yeah. it's so funny. Like, every time I go to the plate, even now, yeah. I don't even want to be backstage. Yep. I want to sit down. We have, like, Obviously, you've been to the play in mm -hmm. the last like few years, mm -hmm. but we have like the movie theater seats in a balcony. Yep. I'm like, oh, I want to be on top of that. That's a great place. Like, yeah. I want to be there. Like, hold three seats for me in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the mezzanine. Yep. That's the best place <laughs> to watch a show from. Yeah. I love going up there. Uh, there's a balcony in the House of Blues in Boston. That's my other favorite balcony. Yeah. Uh, familiar, that, absolutely. Like, top third level there. Irving Plaza has a really great yep. one, too. Yep. Those are sick. It's my uh, place. Are those, are the Webster and Palladium the two venues you've worked with? Like, did you ever mm -hmm. venture into the New York or other markets? Never. Scenes? Uh, I did a few shows in Poughkeepsie. Okay. For a little bit. I, I did like counterparts there mm -hmm. and I think like maybe I did like two or three other shows there. Okay. Um, but I didn't do too much there. I was, I was, was kind of focusing in Danbury and I've done shows in Boston before. Uh, like, you know, did shows at like the Wang theater, like not stuff that I booked, but like was working, mm -hmm. um, like straight no chaser, which is like an acapella group, basically like, like mm -hmm. 60 year old women. Yep. <laughs> um, and then there'd be like stuff like we'd get offered like Stephen Wilson, which is from mm -hmm. this like pro progressive rock band Porcupine Tree, which in like progressive, you know, rock communities, you know, one of the biggest artists and stuff like that was too trendy to play Worcester. Yeah. So the guy that I worked for, John Peters, he'd put that in Boston, like Berkeley with like a bunch of music nerds. Yep. So I worked in different places. Um, we did a we did a show many years ago at Brockton Fairgrounds. Punk and Drublick, mm -hmm. which was like Fat Mike's uh, from No Effects's music festival, craft craft beer too, and yeah, I mean, uh, I always enjoyed those. Like those would always be long days because I would drive from Connecticut to Boston to work that mm -hmm. and not stay over. I would just drive straight back. That's so we're talking like twenty four hour days. Yep. But I always loved it because it was like new scenery, new mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Plus, like you know, I would I would be able to like walk across the street and get food that I couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. So. Kind of missed those days a little bit. They were fun. In uh, in hindsight, what like defined a show as successful or not successful? So when we're looking back at these Webster shows, and I guess it's probably still similar to what you're doing now and similar criteria, but yeah, the past tense is safer to work with. Uh, <laughs> what makes something a good show or a bad show? I assume some of that's financial. If we 
offered fifty thousand dollars and recouped forty five. Like we lost five. That's bad. But yeah. like, what else is going on in terms of like, yeah, what makes a good show or bad show? What stands out as your as your best nights? Is it your favorite bands that you booked or the bad nights? What's yeah? What is a bad show? There's no money made. What it, it comes on? It probably comes on money as terrible as it, as it yeah. sounds because there's no worse feeling, especially if you're working a show that you booked yeah. and it loses a ton of money. Yeah, it's like the worst feeling. Like you you're beating yourself up the entire night, being mm-hmm. like, "Why did I do this?" Sure. Yeah. Especially, it really sucks when it's a band that is really talented that you're like, you fully believe in that, you know, is just sonically like sonically, musically, everything all in there's amazing. And there's bands like that, you know, um, one of my favorite bands who's no longer around is let live and they got big support tours, but when it came to headlining, they just never broke, which killed me because like, I don't know if you ever saw them, but it's uh, Jason Elon who's in three, three, three fever, three, three, three. He's a maniac. The guy is like running across stage, like he's climbing <laughs> scaffolds. He's like yeah. jumping out into the crowd. Like the guy's a lunatic. But yep. when I first saw them, I had him at the Air Marcy and I uh, co promoted it with the guy, Brian, um, who was booking the place at the time. Hmm. And I remember it snowed. Guy went berserk, you know, guy, the, you know, during a set, like Jason went berserk, like jumped into the crowd. Landed on his back, thought he had to go to hospital, started screaming like a maniac, went to the back. I mean, he just put on, he gave it 110% regardless yeah. of the 70 people <laughs> that were there. Yep. So, you know, it's those shows, like, even if they lose money, like, sometimes there are certain ex- exceptions where you're like, well, you know what? I may have lost money, but I feel like the next time I have this band, they're mm-hmm. going to be huge. That's and a, it doesn't happen very yeah. often, right? Like, most shows you lose money, you're like, ah, this sucks. Mm-hmm. Well, ah, there's another day. Yeah. But sometimes you're just like, yeah, I lost money, but I know this band is going to be big one day. And there has been bands like that who have just popped off and become massive. Uh, I'm also um, kind of reading between the lines. You're also saying you feel like you let the band down, which I think is an interesting side of this. It's not that we just lost money on the thing. It's the, the personal side of you saying like, oh, I thought we were going to give them an opportunity and it didn't pan out. And I think that's an interesting like human part. It's like when you go to the venue and mm-hmm. it's like, it is a business, but this is a business run by people who love this thing and like a... Uh, yeah, you couldn't be the booker without this intimate knowledge well, of the scene. And part of that means you want to help it grow and succeed. And when it doesn't, it's it's personal on some yeah. level. The, it's two components of that. Yeah, there's like the, I work for somebody, I'm losing their money. Yeah. So it's like your job. Yeah. But there's also the, yeah, the, to your point, like the biggest component is like, you kind of feel like a failure. Yeah. And I am one of those people where no matter where I'm at in life, I feel like I'm not good enough. Sure. And that's just like who I am as a person. You know, I'm very ambitious and anybody that knows me well enough knows that I've always been that way. So I think it's tough, you know, because you feel like I let this person down. I feel Mm -hmm. like I let this person out. I feel like I let everybody in the crowd up as they came to the show and they're like, wow, why this is such a depressing atmosphere. Like people that love this band, like, you know, be a super fan in the crowd be like, there's 20 other people here. And you know, what's funny is I've never, I've never even had that thought from the fan's perspective. Right. And Mm -hmm. it makes sense that as a, yeah, from your, I don't know, front office kind of perspective, that makes a lot of sense. But from the fans' perspective, when I go and the show is sold out, I think, wow, this band is great. I never think that someone did a good job promoting it. Yeah. And when I go and the show is empty, I'm like, oh, these idiots don't know how good this band is. Like, fuck everyone else. <laughs> like, there's not a thought in my brain of like, oh, someone fucked up today. <laughs> and it's interesting that, yeah, I guess we all have some version of that in our lives of like, we project all this pressure on ourselves. And then the flip side is like, no, people just showed up and saw a show and they were very disinterested in a lot of these details yeah, and, that and keep I think, us up. I think you're right. Like, it's kind of an irrational fear. Yeah. fear. You know, I just think for me, like, I do have a personality type where it's like... I think it's perfectly rational. I think it's just, yeah, we all have this. And for me, it's my yeah. video, right? Like, I put a video and it's like, oh, fuck, what if they don't like the color? And it's like, dude, they just heard the song and saw it half-hearted. They didn't think anything else about the video. Yeah, like, 100%. they just heard the song and saw people. There's nothing else that went through their brain. None of these details mattered. None of these things I stressed out matter. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and yeah, I assume it's a similar thing there. <laughs> uh, we're coming just about to our hour, uh, which I like to pause it. Uh, before I get you out of here, I want to touch on the aviation thing for a second. Yeah. Uh, so I know recently you've been flying planes everywhere, which is the coolest <laughs> thing to me. Uh, my quick question is, yeah, is this like a lifelong thing that you now are able to actualize in the last five years? Did you, yeah, we're able to take it up? Like, is this a childhood dream you're actualizing? Where does this come from? Yeah, so uh, my uncle's a commercial pilot. Okay. And my grandfather um, was a commercial pilot. He didn't fly for the airlines. He just had his commercial rating, but he had like a normal job. That's cool. Um, so I kind of have aviation in my blood, if you will. Cool, okay. But I do remember distinctly, like, my uncle, I, w- I went out to visit him, and he lived in uh, in Arizona. Mm-hmm. 
so when I came out, he took me up in a small single engine plane and we flew from like Prescott, Arizona to Sedona. And that was like, in my opinion, like the coolest thing I've ever done at that point in my life. Sure. Yeah. And after that, I was like, I want to do this at some point. Obviously, aviation is ridiculously expensive to get into. Mm -hmm. You were alluding to yeah, growing up without a ton of financial opportunity. So, yeah. yeah. So for me, it's like it wasn't thing. really it wasn't realistic. So, you know, I got to a point later in my life, you know, in the last few years where like, you know, I started doing, you know, well for myself. So I said, you know what, like maybe I'll produce, pursue this at some point. Yeah. So I, I think it all started like, because I think the thing that kicked me was I actually, uh, during a pandemic, I was so bored because I had nothing to do. Yeah. I wasn't furloughed or wasn't laid off, <laughs> Sure. but I had nothing to do. So I was like, I bought a drone. Step one. Yep. I got, I got a drone. Yep. And after I got said drone, I, be, I, you know, spent all the free time that I had in my apartment uh, you know, taking a course <laughs> to become a commercial drone pilot license. Gotcha. So that's yeah. your toe yeah. into all the FAA certifications. So, and stuff. so I, yeah. I did like the ground school for that, mm -hmm. you know, passed the test. And I did like a few real estate gigs because I was like kind of hurting for money because I was getting paid that's like half work. of my salary. <laughs> yep. Um, so I, and then I did, uh, actually want to learn Shores music videos, like drone shots and which is kind of fun. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know. That's really cool. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Are these one of the, the recent ones or like, is this yeah, the, one of the recent ones, one you of the know, Will Ramos yeah, ones yep. That's cool. That's so, cool. Uh, hand I think it well. was to the hellfire. Oh, the one. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Which, which was actually filmed, uh, here in Connecticut. Okay, cool. But, uh, so I, I admittedly, I haven't really done too much with that, mm -hmm. but I feel like that I did that. And I was like, oh man, I really want to fly airplanes. So then, like, that's a huge step from yeah, this toy yeah. to the actual thing. So, like, I, I, I just like, I really want to do that. I really want to, really want to try it. So, yeah. like, I, admittedly, it was not the smartest thing. I was, you know, still not doing. I was doing better because I was like, everything. The pandemic was starting su to subside. So, sure. I still don't have enough money. So I took actually took out a personal loan to, for yeah. flight training, which yeah. probably wasn't the best idea. Sure, I paid it off. Like, you know. Sometimes you got to do what you got to so, do. But I did it and I don't regret it at all. That's awesome. So I started flight training and um, I loved it. First, first lesson, I was like addicted to it. I was That's like, cool. I have to do this. That's cool. Um, so I just kept on doing it. And uh, quite honestly, I'd have a lot more money to my name this day. <laughs> but it's a lot. It's a lot of fun. The money doesn't go to the grave with it, you. It, yeah. was, it was one of those things where it took a long time. Yeah. A lot of sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. Like... It, becoming a pilot is insanely difficult. Interesting. You okay. have to, you, you, if you are not good at multitasking, you got to learn how to be good at multitasking. You yeah. got to be good, good at paying attention. Mm -hmm. You have to be focusing on 10 different things at once. And you're responsible not only for your life, but like, you know, the lives of other people. Everyone under you in some like sense. I, I, yeah. I flew to Nantucket this weekend. Like it was me and my girlfriend mm -hmm. and uh, her two friends who mm -hmm. were like, you know, really great people. But it's my first time, like, I've, I've taken my girlfriend flying a few times, but the first mm -hmm. time carrying, like, two other people, and yeah. I was, like, nervous. Yeah. I was confident. I mean, like, I'm 130 hours in. I've had my pilot's license since yeah. April, but yeah. I'm still like, oh, wow, mm -hmm. I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's how I'm here right now. Yeah. I, I somehow, like, I went through my flight training, kept at it, and uh, as far as, like, my goals, I mean... I'm working on my instrument rating, which allows me to fly in the clouds, like weather. That's cool. And then I'm working on my commercial rating after. Damn. So. Good for you. That's a long way. Yeah. A part of why I think it's so cool is I think it's uh, evident of the personality type that made the show stuff so successful. It's like, as I've had these conversations with people, what I've heard a lot of people say, and I mean this respectfully, is that we're all kind of crazy in some sense. There's all some oh, part yeah. of us of like, this shouldn't work. This has no business working, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> uh, and I think I hadn't quite appreciated how deep that was. And as I saw you get into planes. It's like, oh, yeah, this is a daring, ambitious person who's going to figure it out. And yeah, aviation isn't a, isn't a logical thing. I assume, yeah, you mentioned how daunting it would be. Um, so yeah, I think it's an interesting kind of reflection of your personality type that are the yeah a testament to your personality type the yeah, hard work that it takes I, to go into it it definitely have a little crazy yeah I, I, the first time i flew a plane alone yeah flight instructor hops out and he's like i didn't expect it he's like hops out of the plane he said it's all you now do three takeoff and landings without me i was nervous with sweating bullets yeah. taxing up to that runway yeah and i was like you know what like the way i, I view life in this way in general mm -hmm. i'm like you got to take risks sometimes yeah because like, and honestly, like I, those are the moments that make me feel most alive, which is like yeah. kind of sickening. Sure. Um, but that's my personality type. Yeah. Like next, after I complete all this, I'm going to go get my, you know, skydiving license. 
I don't know if it's a license or a certification, whatever it's called. Going to say, yeah, you're either going to go up or down. You're going to go into the water or find more ways to be. But there's a. But you know what? That's like I'm like. Those are the moments, like when I do that, it makes me feel alive and it makes working yeah. like a crazy person worth every second. That's cool. That's awesome. That's a, a good a good place to end this on. I think, it, yeah, it's an incredible sentiment. I think it's worth us all finding some piece of that. It's like, I don't know, I have this dilemma with, with video. It's like, I love video. I love it more than anything, but it's worth having other hobbies that I'm interested in. And I guess with you, the aviation, it's like, this doesn't mean you don't love shows or love music. It's just you have to explore other things and it'll enrich kind you of, can't, yeah, circle back. One thing I will say to end it all is you can't let your job define who you are. Yeah. Like, it's good to be passionate about what you do. Sure. But I, for a long time, the first many years of booking shows, it almost felt like it defined my personality and who I was. Yeah. Yep. I couldn't tell you if I had a hobby or anything outside of music. Mm-hmm. And when you live and breathe it, it's all consuming. So yeah. it's like flying yep. airplanes for me, even if it's like one to three times a week, it's like my escape. And it's like, I'm Justin Leach, mm-hmm. not the promoter, not, you know, this guy, not that guy. This plane doesn't give a fuck what I, I've exactly. done. This plane like, just needs to have these things done. And I got to pay yeah. attention to not kill myself. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, how mundane does driving feel now? After you've had this like expressway all through the world, be on the highway it must just be the worst feeling. It is. It, it, dude, it's it's painful. Like, I'm like, oh, I say this to my girlfriend all the time. I could have, we could have flown up here in half the time and not deal with all these idiots. Because I'm like that, like, grandpa driver, just of course. like all these stupid people on the road. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, Justin Leach, I appreciate coming out. Episode 31. Uh, is there anything you want to plug before you get here anywhere? People should find you on social media. I know normally with bands, we got an album or EP, but um, you're in a unique boat there. Not necessarily. I mean, I'm I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. Yeah. I don't use them as much as I probably should. Awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, come to New England Metal and Hardcore Fest. A lot Hell of yeah. work has gone into that. It's back. It's going to be awesome. Hell yeah. Um, Looking forward to it. Awesome. I appreciate making time. And yeah, thank you for all the shows, all the all the places you gave us an opportunity to express our own hobbies and interests. So uh, thanks for having me, I appreciate man. that. This Hopefully is great. other people reach out and thank you as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but awesome, man. That's mission. Accomplished.